disadvantage of YouTube live is that you can't ask questions live. I mean, it has to be through the you know chat. Okay. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have uh, somewhat unusual time. Uh, this event, uh, of course, to uh, to ensure that our speaker uh, is able to kind of comfortably uh, give uh, his lecture at a, at a reasonable time. Uh, that is John Leonard from University of Hawaii. Uh, he is going to talk on neutrinos or smart uh, blind ranging of nuclear reactors. I mean, there's actually a two parts, you can say, of the talk. And uh, so thank you so much, John, for agreeing to give this talk today uh, uh, on this very, very interesting uh, topic and topic of uh, a lot of interest to I know and other communities in India. Uh, so without taking uh, more of your time, uh, I now request uh, Professor Vivek Dathar, the former project director of the I know project, to do, introduce today's speaker and uh, then invite the speaker to start his lecture. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, let me uh, do the uh, uh, formality of uh, introducing uh, Professor John Learned. Uh, uh, I mean, the first time I wrote an email, I, I, I wrote this full thing and then he said, you can call me John and that's how now. I mean, in India, I think we are a little more formal uh, usually. Uh, uh, less so than in the U.S. Okay, so John uh, started his career, of course, he was uh, born 1940 in upstate New York. Uh, he did his B.S. Uh, uh, in 1961, M.S. in University of Pennsylvania in 1963, and a Ph.D. from University of Washington in 68. In between, he, uh, I think, also did some engineering, and uh, he, in fact, worked uh, in Boeing, as he just now said, was involved in some cryptography and stuff like that, and as a patent on it. But as he says, no money <laughs> uh, from that uh, patent. Uh, so he, he then uh, went to uh, SLAC. Uh, first, I think the University of California at Irvine, then SLAC, then University of Wisconsin, and at the high altitude lab at Echo, Colorado. So an interesting factoid is that he used to not drive to work at uh, this uh, place in Colorado, but used to ride to work. And that was quite a... <laughs> I mean, it must have been quite a interesting and a nice experience. Uh, he has, of course, uh, worked earlier in the area of cosmic ray physics, uh, uh, but also in uh, particle physics when he was at SLAC and other places. Um, and of course, he is a pioneer in starting the new field of astroparticle physics, uh, mainly through his connection to neutrinos. So, uh, apart from the uh, you know the IMB that he was a co-author of. The letter, uh, the letter uh, not letter of it, sorry, he was the co founder of the IMB experiment, which was uh, primarily aimed at uh, detecting proton decay, but in fact also found uh, supernova neutrinos and atmospheric neutrinos, the first hints of neutrino oscillation. Uh, he was the co author of the letter of intent with uh, Francis Halzen uh, to NSF for the ice cube detector, which, as you all know, has uh, you know, is a fantastic uh, thing that has happened in the last maybe 15, 15 20 years. Uh, he has, of course, uh, co-authored many, many papers, got many awards, some of which I will list. But he has also written papers on some, you know, uh, very interesting uh, things, which are uh, uh, kind of neutrinos for communication, uh, also a very important area, which he will talk about today, uh, nuclear reactor monitoring, uh, which is concerned with non-proliferation, but also geoneutrinos. I mean, the fact that uh, half the heat put out by the Earth's core uh, is due to uh, radioactive heat is something that he uh, has worked on and also through the Kamland detector and so on. He, the, among the many prizes that he has got are the Rossi Prize in 1989, the Asahi Prize in 1998, the UH Regents Medal for Excellence in Research in 1999, the ARCS Scientist of the uh, Year Award in 2007. And of course, he hit a triple in getting the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for three different uh, kind pieces of work in 2015. Uh, he's a great host. I, I have come to know from uh, you know, many colleagues that, uh, uh, that I have uh, uh, talked to or maybe through emails and so on. Um, 
and I hope to partake of that <laughs> sometime when I go to Hawaii. Definitely. Uh, Post-COVID, I guess. Um, carpentry is one of his great hobbies and he's actually almost a professional uh, carpenter in the sense that some of his artworks were exhibited. I came to know in the 2018 Hawaii Wood Show, uh, which was uh, organized by the Honolulu Academy of Arts. Uh, so with these few words, I now request uh, John to give his uh, extremely interesting, uh, uh, title, interestingly titled talk, Neutrinos are Smart. Hey, thank you, Vivek. Uh, yes, I'm happy to do so. But the subtitle of the talk, but I, which I left off, was that photons are stupid. But I didn't want to insult the astronomers. <laughs> I'll explain more about that. And by the way, you're uh, mentioning uh, my former collaborators. So I, I certainly want to uh, uh, recall Sandeep Pagvasa as uh, my dearest friend in the department here and uh, collaborator on a lot of different things since uh, around 1980, uh, who departed us uh, three weeks ago, I guess. And uh, damn, gonna miss him a lot. Uh, but also when, when you were talking about the old, my, some of my early work, uh, I worked on the Echo Lake cosmic ray experiment and it was cosmic ray stuff we were doing. And I was thinking that my first Indian collaborator was there, someone you may know, an elder of the business, P.V. Ramanan Murthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ah, who was my yes. very good friend. And yes. uh, so uh, I, I and yeah, there were several others, but I've enjoyed uh, uh, interactions over the many years with the Indian cosmic ray community in particular, and the, the good old days when people had experiments going in the Kolar gold fields. But those days are gone. Hopefully wonderful new days are about to start in, in Tamil uh, at, at, the, uh, uh, at the Indian Neutrino Observatory. Okay. So I always like, think that it's a good thing to start with a joke. This is not a very good joke, but when we were, uh, the news was going on about the Nobel Prize in 2015, the local newscaster said, neutrinos, what are neutrinos? They must be a new breakfast food. So we made a cartoon of that, breakfast neutrinos. They're very low calorie. So this is a list of where neutrinos come from. I won't bore you too much with, uh, or at least the professionals, with what's a neutrino, but I will remind you that these are the sources of neutrinos. And I've had this slide for many years and slowly but surely been checking off the, uh, the kinds of neutrinos that we've seen. And nuclear reactors were first and still one of the favorite sources. Particle accelerators at CERN and Fermilab and, and Tokai. The Earth's atmosphere were also close to the beginning in Kolar gold fields in South Africa. Uh, from the natural uh, radioactivity of the Earth's crust, which we got started with the observations in Camland and then uh, later in Borxino in 2003, somewhere around there from the sun going way back to the radiochemical observations and the solar neutrino controversy that lasted until it got settled in the early 2000s by uh, Subercay, Snow, uh, Boric, Sino, and, uh, and Camland. Uh, supernova, we've seen only one, there should be you know, maybe a few per century, but we haven't seen anything since 1987. And there have been detectors on pretty, uh, pretty nearly continuously, so we would not have missed it. So in a certain sense, we're due, but of course that's a nonsense statement. Um, astrophysical accelerators was the slowest one to get started. And finally, our friends in Ice Cube uh, and then later uh, some other experiments have come through. And uh, so neutrinos have been seen at up around PEV coming from uh, beyond our galaxy. Big Bang neutrinos, I always say in this talk, uh, using this slide to, for, to the young people in the audience, if you wanna get a Nobel prize for sure, just figure out a way to do this. <laughs> but they're too low in energy, their cross sections too small is the hardest problem around. Okay, 
Uh, so I refer to what we call NUDAR, Neutrino Detection and Ranging. And basically uh, the, the issue is that the spectral shape is modulated by uh, some kinds of sines and cosines of uh, a ratio of uh, the distance to energy. And uh, by using that, uh, you can uh, discern how far the neutrinos have flown. And uh, for the low energies that we're talking about, mostly for reactor neutrinos, they're below the threshold for muon or tau neutrinos. And so basically, the, as I'll illustrate, the neutrinos go from being potentially visible, they can interact, to definitely not visible because they're below threshold. Uh, and, and the net result is that the observed spectrum, what you will observe sitting at a given location, depends uniquely on the distance of the source. And I'll show you more about that. But just comparing with, to radar, radar requires you to send a signal out and it kills you by one over distance to the fourth power. So neutrinos are only one over uh, distance squared. There is of course a little problem in that you need a huge, huge detector because the neutrino cross section is so small. And for people who are not neutrino experts, there is not a damn thing we can do about that. I had a, a government person offer us lots of money if we could make a handheld neutrino detector. I said, you know, no matter how much money you give me, there's one thing we cannot do. We cannot fool with the cross section. So um, here's a nice colorful chart of energy on the vertical axis here and distance on the horizontal axis. And those colors show the survival probability. So when it's up here bright red, they're all getting there, or even black, they're all getting there. And when it's blue, they're not getting there. And so if you're sitting at a particular distance, then uh, the uh, survival of the neutrinos getting to you will be, whoops, will be modulated by this, this uh, factor, which has to do with the oscillations. And just to show you, the oscillations, is the formula involved, it can get complicated, of course, but if you boil it down, it's just a couple of cosines and sines and cosines, depending on how you write it out, as a function of, oops, that should be an L, uh, distance divided by energy. And so it's a simple enough formula. But what you see here is that at any given location, when I go look across the range of neutrino energies, uh, there's a unique pattern. And uh, here is Juno, which you probably know about, the wonderful big detector our Chinese friends are building, uh, which is 55 kilometers out. And uh, Watchman, which we're starting to build in, uh, in Bulby in England, is 25 kilometers out. And I put in here that Eno to the uh, Kudankulam, I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation, probably not, uh, power station, which is right down at the tip of India, is 205 kilometers away. And so I just know how, how I, I only just made the, the, put this bar on here to see this. And it's really quite neat because uh, here's the neutrino spectrum and the, the react, uh, spectrum times cross section peaks up at a little more than four MeV, but it goes up to six, seven, eight MeV. So there's a pass band up here and then a couple of uh, a couple of other pass bands going down so if you have a detector that's going to see that uh, power station from eno it, it would be good to have a threshold that goes down to uh, below 2 mev and then you could see uh, three loops in the in the absorption of the neutrinos which would give you nice measurements of various things so but I, most of this talk, I want to really just uh, emphasize a, a simple property. Uh, all types of electromagnetic radiation, radio, light, x-rays, gammas, blah, 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 they all have a regular wavelengths, the same damn thing over and over and over. Same wavelength, nothing happens if it crosses the whole universe unless it loses energy or in the case of universal scales, the, the, the scale changes. <laughs> because of the expansion of the universe. 
So uh, it's the same with the, the de Broglie wavelength of any particle. It's unchanging unless the energy changes. The wavelength is the wavelength, that's that. So, uh, you know, at a, at a gigahertz, it's 30 centimeters and it's 30 centimeters, no matter how far away you go. So there are some other fundamental particles that oscillate. Uh, the neutrinos are, are, are unique, but they, there are some, and a couple of analogies, which are well known to the particle physicists in the crowd, K0, K0 bar and, and B, B0 mesons oscillate. And uh, they, uh, they have finite lifetimes, so they don't last very long. Although K longs, as the old cosmic rares know, K longs last long enough at high energies to make it to the ground. But of course, then they get eaten up so they don't go underground. But at any rate, they're very interesting stories for those. And those in the HEP business know that uh, it's a huge industry and there's experiments that continue on like the big Bell collaboration in Japan. Uh, so also uh, decays can be used to get, uh, can be used to get a distance in, in one way, which is that if you have a cosmic ray uh, isotope with a finite lifetime, the beryllium 10 has a 1.4 million year lifetime. And so you can look at the ratio of beryllium 10 to beryllium nine, and you can figure out that the lifetime of cosmic rays in the galaxy is about 15 million years, but you need a normalization. You need two numbers for that. Um, and uh, so I want to say that decaying particles have no memory. They don't know what time it is. If you're on a decaying isotope, all you know is that you've got a ticking bomb underneath you, which has a random probability that's the same at every moment. And when it goes off, it goes off and you won't be there anymore. So they have, in that sense, they have no memory. And also photons have no memory, which is a little fun to think about because at the speed of light, time does not progress. If you could ride on a spaceship traveling at the speed of light, you would have eternal life. Any rate, uh, neutrinos in some sense know what time it is because the phases of their mass eigenstates were zero at that time. Did I hear a question in the background? No? Do interrupt if you have a question, it's fine with me. Yeah, yeah. So if it's a long one, we'll put it off till the end. Um, so neutrinos, uh, cycle between their various uh, flavor states cyclically. And uh, also fortunately, because there are several different masses, these are not commensurate so that the oscillations are, the ratio of the oscillations is always slightly different. And the two faster of the oscillations have a distance of around characteristic distance wavelength, if you will, of around uh, four kilometers at four MeV. And uh, at two kilometers, uh, that, that, then uh, it would be, it would be uh, half that. Or if you go to uh, twice the energy, it would be the same. So eight MeV at two kilometers. So lo the longer range is 110 kilometers, which is useful for uh, uh, longer distances. So that's really kind of neat that we have these two ranges and 55 kilometers is special and that's where the Juno detector is located. Um, so with one observation location and measuring a number of events over a span of energies, you can't, one event doesn't get you anything. Uh, you can figure out where, what was the common origin of those and, and this is an interesting thing because this is so, nothing that you can fool with if you're interested in security and so on. You know, one thing you cannot fool with is, is the neutrinos. So you can't shield the reactor and you can't change the phases of the neutrinos once they've been let loose. And people often say, well, won't you get confused by multiple reactors? That's a long story, but uh, we've written a paper where we explore this and you can sort out multiple reactors, it's a long story. So here is uh, the one for which I have some more numbers. The one kiloton watchman uh, detector that we're building 
uh, in the northeast of England, uh, just by the coast in a, in a mine there. And uh, so the spectrum versus distance looks this way. The last time I showed you the spectrum without it being tapered off by the rising and falling edges. And this is what it looks like when it's tapered uh, and uh, by the reactor spectrum. So you see that as I make a slice across here, different places, I get a different looking spectrum at every location. And just to show you that with, uh, this is a Camland uh, resolution, with that amount of resolution, the, the crinkly potato chip pattern doesn't disappear. So uh, this is a slightly fancier formula for the three neutrino mixing. And uh, there's some interesting complications here that, uh, so these are, if you're not familiar with this business, these are called mixing angles. And for our purposes, they're just constants. In fact, we have spent 20 years or so trying to measure these as accurately as we could. And that's what all the experiments were focused on trying to get these. We actually know them pretty well now to percent kind of level. And then this is the oscillating term out here to the right, depending on the mass difference, uh, the difference of the mass squared. Uh, so it's a constant that we have no control over times the distance divided by the energy. And this is what we have control over. So for a fixed location, the distance is fixed and, fixed and we can look at different energies as we receive them. So uh, the amplitudes of the different terms are different as well. Uh, and that has to do with the size of these mixing angle terms. And as I said, they're uh, like this in, whoop, in the ratios. And just if anybody's into communications engineering, it is kind of cute that this is sort of like a chirp signal because it's one over the energy and, and communications engineers like chirp signals. They're, they're nice to home in on. Um, how do oscillations work? My mouse is behaving strangely here. So uh, if there are three mass states, uh, the energy and momentum are of course conserved for each of those states, each of those wave packets. And so you say, well, what the hell is going on here? How can they, how can they interfere with each other? They're, they're something, if you fix the energy, then the momentum's gonna be different or the other way around. Well, this is tricky quantum mechanics, but basically all you and I really need to know, the experts know more details, is that uh, it, you're, we're, we're hiding under, under the uncertainty principle, basically, that the wave packets, uh, as long as they overlap, it's the uncertainty principle that lets us get away with this. Um, and of course, we know that now that for the last 20 years or so, that neutrinos do indeed oscillate. Uh, and and, and there, are, there are many papers about this, as you may imagine, Theoreticians have had a field day in thinking about this and people saying, well, maybe there's a catch here somewhere. But uh, as in this, a recent paper, take note, 2019 already, even now people are still worrying about it. Here someone had, people had done some very fancy calculations with quantum simulation in a quantum computer. And sure enough, it all works out. Uh, so here's what it looks like for a simple case of uh, two neutrino oscillations. If you have an electron neutrino, uh, it is uh, looking like this, which is a composite of two mass states and they will separate a little bit with time. And if they have the same frequency, then nothing funny will be going on. But if they're slightly different, then you'll get uh, enforcement and cancellation and the net result will be, uh, come on here, will be something like this. As these guys get in phase and out of phase, so the uh, electron neutrino in between the two will appear, if you could observe it all the way along, to come and go. That's neutrino oscillations, so it's, it's a funny business. The neutrino has not disappeared, and this is all you get to see.
So uh, one thing that, that, again, this is mainly for people who are like particle physics and thinking about crazy things, uh, the wave packets are separating and there's something called the coherence distance over which the wave packets actually separate. And if you went far enough away, by golly, you might see three wave packets arriving at different times. So that's very cool. Um, unfortunately, the distance that's involved, I'll show you what that is in a moment on this other slide. It would require a very sharp burst of neutrinos from uh, uh, a Z of a several a long ways away uh, in order to be able to see this. So it's something we're probably, I can't imagine how we will ever see it, but it's really cool to think about. Um, and there's reference there if anybody wants to look up, but there are a lot of papers. So another thing I wanted to say about neutrinos, it's weird about the neutrino business is that uh, I think there's a goddess of neutrinos up there who has smiled on us because a number of the neutrino distances are sort of uh, as nice as they could be for us being able to observe neutrinos on Earth. Uh, as I said, there are these two distances that are comfortable distances for terrestrial observations. Um, and uh, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, one has to have a, a good big detector to play this game. So 55 kilometers is a magic distance. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, but it is the distance at, at which that the longer wavelength is just uh, in its first big dip. And uh, well, you'll see more about that in a moment. Um, so there's this paper that we, a long paper, physics reports, which nobody reads because it's complicated and it's long, but there are some good calculations in there. Um, so how do you sort this out when you've got this ranging business? If I have a detector that gives me a range to a reactor, then it, it defines a ring around the reactor. And if I have two detectors, the rings intersect in two places, so there are two possible solutions. And you can use this to figure out where reactors are. So we're interested in uh, the non-proliferation business uh, where we're wanting to keep track of people who are making, uh, making plutonium, basically, in, in countries like North Korea and Iran. Uh, so this is the detector in uh, uh, the watchman detector. Sorry, that's a lousy picture. But the detector looks sort of like this, a kiloton detector filled with either uh, gadolated gadolinium in water or with a, a, a water-based liquid scintillator. It'll be online in about 2024. It's 25 kilometers away from big reactor complex at uh, Hartlepool, uh, which is a, a very old fashioned, in fact, uh, gas uh, power reactor, but it's, it's a good big, it's a pair of reactors. It's a, a four kilowatts, four megawatts thermal and uh, about 2% of the UK power is there. So this is what the spectrum uh, looks like and it's attenuated down. And then, uh, and th so this is the long-term oscillation, this hump here. So we're not seeing much in that because it's not very far away. And then the shorter uh, solar term oscillating more frequently as you go to lower energies, LORE. So, we immediately thought about, well, wait a minute, if we plot the spectrum differently, we part, they plot the inverse spectrum, then there'll be just nice regularly, regular oscillations. And we physicists all love Fourier transforms. In fact, I think some of my theoretical friends live in Fourier transform space. At least that's what I always used to tell Sandy. And uh, so if you do the Fourier transform, then you can get a peak out, which will tell you the periodicity, or if you know the constants, it'll tell you the distance. Oh, and a little side band, a side, side issue on that is that if you know about Fourier transforms, 
having a smoothed uh, Fourier transform at the edges, which people do with window functions, a Gaussian being the big favorite, it suppresses sidebands and it's naturally that way. So here is uh, an example for the 50 kilometer range from a program I wrote some years ago. And here I'm plotting it versus delta m squared, where I fix the distance and I'm varying delta m squared, but I can just as well fix delta m squared and vary the distance and you'll get the same answer. But this is what, the, what this main peak looks like. It's a heck of a good peak. So coming down from here, the Fourier power in some arbitrary units, and you get this uh, very, very big peak. And you see here that the peak is a little asymmetrical, and that's because there are two terms there, and, uh, and uh, that, that bump on the shoulder, well, I'll show you next. So this is just the same thing with the linear scale to impress you on what a lovely peak that is which you can use to find range. So if you're looking at that peak in detail, which is what our friends in Juno are trying to do at 50 kilometers, you get a little hump on one side or the other, and it turns out, uh, uh, as the neutrino experts amongst you know very well, that hump depends on the sign of the, of the mass hierarchy. So you can use this to figure out the mass hierarchy, but you better have a damn good detector to do that. And that's just what our Chinese friends are trying to do at Juno. And by the way, also the paper in which we first realized the importance of this ability, we were talking about an experiment underwater offshore, but Sandeep and I were uh, chief conspirators in the game for this. So uh, for Watchman, the total number of events obviously goes up if, if the reactor is running smoothly and not stopping. It goes up smoothly with time. Uh, and so the number of standard deviations above background uh, goes up like this. So you see that we get around 500 events, should get around 500 events per year at uh, Bowlby. And I couldn't resist calculating for a, a 30 gigawatt uh, Kudan Coulomb, uh, if you had a 50 kiloton Eno with a threshold down to a couple of MeV, you'd have 3,700 inverse beta decay events per year, which we could have a lot of fun with. <laughs> so how does one analyze the data? Well, there's not time to get into that, but there's, uh, I, I do love the business of making Fourier transforms because the noise, uh, Flat noise is flat noise and, and the signals pile up uh, coherently. So you improve the signal to noise when you do that. And you can run a correlation function in the energy space, or you can look in the Fourier transform space. So this was a, a rough calculation of what the distance resolution, and it, it's pretty poor at uh, Bowlby because we're only seeing one lump in the big distribution uh, but it looks like if we had everything uh, done well, we'd have a sort of a 5% range resolution with the uh, Bowlby detector. So the larger picture uh, with other than uh, reactors, over what distance could we play this range game? So uh, of course the best case is uh, with with the reactor energies, because if you go to higher energies, you're gonna make the distances longer. So for terrestrial it, it, it reactor neutrinos is the right thing to do. And in principle, we could do it out to, uh, you know, a fair fraction of the distance uh, across the earth, but then you have to have a larger and larger detector. Um, uh, long baseline neutrinos from accelerators almost works. The trouble there is that the energies are higher, Fermilab to Homestake, Tokai to Kamioka, that's 300 kilometers, uh, but the energies are high, but uh, nobody has really explored this. Everybody's been focused on measuring the, uh, the, the oscillation parameters and nobody's thought about, let's run the game backwards and see how well we could measure if we didn't know how well we could measure the distance. Um, but it's not easy to do with the reactor, the, sorry, the accelerator experiments because 
for instance, to uh, Grand Sasso, the energy is too high. Anyway, they disable that beam. So uh, I actually, uh, I'll show you a slide that in a moment that, that, that shows that really it's pretty much we're uh, constrained to reactor neutrinos for now, but I'll show you more about that in a moment. Here was in this long paper that we wrote for physics reports where we made pretend reactors and detectors. Here are two detectors in the deep ocean, three detectors in the deep ocean and a, a pretend reactor in Spain. I don't know if Jose's still there. We, we put a reactor in your neighborhood and we put one out in the Horn of uh, Africa. But it turns out that with 100 kiloton detectors and 50 megawatt clandestine reactor, we can find those devils pretty well. And this is three dimensional finding how well one could do with a couple of years of data there. But again, uh, there's a long story, but it shows that this game is functional. Now here is the big picture uh, probing oscillations. So I was like to show this because Tom Weiler christened this the learned plot, which it's nice to have a plot named after you, but I don't think anybody else uses it. <laughs> At any rate, the neutrino energy on the horizontal axis and the distance on the vertical axis. And so these diagonal lines here are constant delta m squared. Uh, uh, so the L over E is constant on these lines, right? So the oscillations are the same along these lines. And the atmospheric and solar terms are like this. So you can look on this map to see, well, if I'm gonna look at PEV, 10 to the 15th EV, I could see out to about the distance of the sun. So we could do oscillations to the sun. The only thing is we don't know of any PEV source of neutrinos from the sun. <laughs> so there should be a few from cosmic rays hitting the limb of the sun, by the way, but it's not a large flux and it's never been detected. Uh, the, the coherence I was talking about, the coherence term has an extra energy term in it and it goes like this, the coherence length but as I said, it ain't just the coherence length that counts. It, it, you have to have enough time between the burst of, or the burst of neutrinos has to be short enough to be able to see multiple arrivals. And uh, so you can see that that ain't about to happen anytime soon. It's, uh, we'd have to be out in here. So here in the nearest stars, we, we might be able to play something if we had friends on Alpha Centauri with a PEV, uh, with a super powerful uh, GEV accelerator pointed at us, uh, but it's, it's a very tough game. So I don't expect uh, that we'll see decoherence, even though it's a lot of fun to think about. Or even the regular oscillation out to, to the nearest stars is uh, not a good prospect. Okay, conclusion, uh, how am I doing? I'm doing well on time. Uh, we, we'll soon have a kiloton water detector, water and gadolinium, water and scintillator, and uh, we'll be able to uh, play some games with, with that, uh, and particularly uh, with an interest toward detecting of later, of course, for, uh, clandestine reactors. Uh, so uh, if, if playing this game, something I didn't say, it, it turns out that reactor spectra are pretty much reactor spectra, as all you nuclear physicists know, because they're, they depend on the beta decays of the fission products, and you can jiggle them around a little bit, but the fission products are pretty much the fission products. And so you've seen one reactor in a certain sense, you've seen them all in terms of the spectrum. It doesn't, it tapers off on both ends in about the same way. So you can play the game with ranging without knowing what kind of reactor it is even. Indeed, it does change a little bit in the burn up. The slope of the higher energies change on the kind of 5% level, whether you have more 235 is burnt or not burnt and so on, but it's, it's small potatoes. Um, 
So, okay, as I've said, it's a blind determination of the reactor parameters. So, yes, and once you have the range, then by the rate of events you're seeing, you know the reactor power. So I can sit underground and I can see the reactor and I can figure out how far away it is and how much power it's got. And I, I don't need to know anything else. Uh, and this has never actually been done. We've been focusing on measuring the oscillation parameters and we haven't gotten around to this rather more mundane but more practical view. So uh, it, in my view, it's uh, for non-proliferation goals for Watchman, this is, it's a, it's a unique goal and something we should focus more on. And I pretty well got the collaboration convinced of that nowadays. Uh, John, can I ask you a question, please? You bet. Okay. So uh, the inverse beta decay also has information about the direction. In oh, principle, yeah. uh, it's not, it's yeah, not yeah. something that is event by event, but on the average. So yes. uh, are you thinking yeah. of using that also in Watchman? Of course, we'll use anything we can get. The catch there is inverse beta decay, uh, you get the, the neutron gets a little kick, so it gets, a, gets the momentum. I always tell the students, the neutron gets the momentum and the positron gets the kinetic energy. The damn positron bounces off in pretty much any old direction. It's slightly backwards, but mainly goes off nearly isotropically. So if you wanna know the direction of the incoming neutrino, you should measure the momentum direction of the neutron, which is horrible. So very hard to do. So if you measure a few thousand events as they've done in show, they can see a slight displacement in the production point and the absorption point of the neutron. And from that, with a few thousand events, they can get a 20, 30 degree measurement of the direction. But uh, it's, it's, it's a tough game. And in a big detector, it's even tougher. So we are certainly, everybody's been scheming about how to do a good job at that. And of course we would love to do it, but it, it's, uh, it, it's very, very tough. Okay. And I couldn't resist putting in this little tickler at the bottom. It's 325 kilometers from Pakistan's big Chasma nuclear plant to India, the border of India near Lahore. So if you guys could put a nice big neutrino detector there, you could keep track of uh, what the Pakistanis are making in their main uh, nuclear production plant. So anyway, motivation for the folks to give you enough money to build a 50 kiloton detector. So, mm -hmm. so the summary, uh, neutrinos have many strange <clears throat> properties. And I think the most amazing is indeed that there are superposition of three different mass states. What a ridiculous thing. What kind of a God would design a silly silly thing like that, that the, the, the flavor state is not the same as the mass state in the neutrinos. That's ridiculous, but that's the way it is. And we have no model that tells us why that's so. Uh, and so all of these other things follow from that, the oscillations and the eventual separation uh, and whoops. Uh, so as I've told you, we could can eventually use that information to parse range and power. So these big detectors, the rate is very low. So we have all the other time with them that we can use for looking for interesting astrophysical phenomena. We could give several talks about that, about all the cool things that we might see, but we have not seen yet with any of our detectors. And of course, the next big galactic supernova that everybody's waiting for. Uh, so there's, and, and that's a really cool thing too. The fact is that there's a lot of physics to be done with these detectors, not just non-proliferation stuff. And it doesn't interfere. You can as well be having fun doing neutrino physics as keeping track of uh, non-proliferation studies. Okay, so, uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions there, that would be a good time. Otherwise, I'll go on to a quick, quick talk about new lab. Yeah, yeah, John. There are quite a number of questions on YouTube as well, but I think we will uh, just wait till you finish this, and we'll take all together. Oh, okay, okay. So new lat stands for neutrino lattice, and again, my friends, my the connection with my friends, my Indian friends. 
uh, is, is really strong. Uh, we call the, this detector, the, the design for it, the Raghavan optical lattice. He invented it for the lens experiment where he was gonna make a really big detector. I think it was gonna be seven meters across and have many different cubes like this. And he's looking for, the idea is look for a, a solar neutrino Indian indium interaction that had a few hundred keV uh, in the final state. So a tough, tough, tough experiment. So I, I knew about that geometry. And by the way, I was good friends with Rajo, so I learned about it from him. And, and so I stole the idea and convinced Bruce that we should make a neutrino detector this way. And indeed, that's what we set off to do. Now the game here is these are individual cubes separated by a little bit of something of a different index of refraction. Uh, and that means that light that goes down one of the rows or columns uh, is constrained by total internal reflection. So a cube hiding in the middle here somewhere, you get light out along six in six locations. So if I put phototubes all over there, I nail down where that initial interaction is. So uh, we've actually, we have a five by five by five prototype uh, which is sitting there in Virginia Tech right now, and we're kind of stalled because we can't get in the lab, we can't do much of anything, and have been stalled for the since uh, when about February, I guess. Um, so uh, this can do lots of things: uh, security monitoring. It can be used for uh, commercial burn up, looking at the burn up the reactor if you've got a big enough one. That is an issue, by the way, for commercial reactors. Uh, where 1% is a lot of money. So if you can do better monitoring than they do, uh, you could potentially help them. Though these days, they've, they're not so interested in that uh, with us. They have better controls, I think. Um, so uh, uh, we can also investigate uh, fast neutron directional capabilities. That's another story having to do with looking for special special nuclear materials, that's to say plutonium. And plutonium, of course, radiates neutrons like hell in pretty high energies. And the detector like this can do directions as well. Uh, we can probe various reactor anomalies. There's the sterile neutrino search that many of you know about that goes on. Uh, it has had its ups and down, but there still is a strange anomaly. It's at around five MeV in the spectrum that nobody knows the source of, but I also don't know of any interesting fundamental physics models for it. Uh, and in any case, we need precision uh, spectrum measurements and various groups are working at that around the world. Uh, the difference for us is that we have full 3D segmentation I'll try to convince you that you especially with our 3D uh, segmentation, we get better rejection of background. Take notice that most of the competing detectors, and there's around a half dozen around the world of people that are making sort of kilt, uh, cubic meter scale detectors for work close to the reactors. And uh, those, uh, those have problems because they're usually basically a long tube with a light detector on either end. And so they easily get confused by backgrounds or events which go along the tube, whereas we can sort out the full three-dimensional geometry generally. John, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Raghavan's original idea was only looking at the precision measurement of uh, solar luminosity. Yeah. So Detection was only through electron neutrinos. Yeah. So when you are talking about the reactors, you are looking at anti-neutrino. Oh yeah. How does it? Yes, work? of course. It's very different. It's very different. What what he was doing was looking for this electron neutrino interaction on indium. Correct. And and it's uh, it's a it's a super tough game it's because there's only one hit. So uh, inverse beta decay is so much more wonderful to play with. Uh, we love electron antineutrinos. Electron neutrinos are much harder. <laughs> yeah. 
but with the well, I'll go, I'll go over this a little bit. But uh, new lat new lat features. There's a list here. I'm not. I think I won't go down this. You can make a small movable detector. But I'll show you more about why it's why it's good here. So this is a nice model which Bruce built, or Bruce and his students built. They have an LED inside, so this is a real photograph. And you see how the light is channeled. It's very strongly channeled. And here is a plot. These are orders of magnitude on the side. So the channeling with the total internal reflection is really wonderful. It's orders of magnitude. So mostly the light from a given cell goes down these six different uh, waves. Now, this is another one that I always have, all of us have had trouble explaining to people. There's three buried LEDs in this model here. It's a real physical model. And, and you see, if you remember your color theory, how they mix so that these two guys are in line and this is projected there deep inside. So it comes out being red and blue makes purple. And uh, uh, so the colors get, get formed in that way. And you see this guy going straight up, green stays green and so on. So you can sort out from seeing a hit in three different cells in this way. Then with this color analogy, you can sort out with amplitude and with time where these originated. And this breaks some of the degeneracies that are of necessity there in some of these other linear detection schemes. So reminding you of inverse beta decay signature, uh, Nui bar P makes a positron and a neutron. And the positron goes right away within a nanosecond or two, slows down and uh, gets uh, annihilated. And the gammas, they go off and generally they leave the scene, but they may interact farther away in the detector, but they're 511 keV, not very energetic. And the neutron thermalizes very quickly and then wanders around till it gets captured either on hydrogen or if you've doped it up with something nice like lithium-6, then lithium-6 gives off a, 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 an, a, an alpha and a triton. And those guys go practically nowhere. They're heavily ionizing. They come to a halt right away. So you get a nice little sharp burst of ionization at the capture point. So we all would love to have lithium-6 detectors for our inverse beta decay because Whereas something like gadolinium, gadolinium's got a giant cross section for soaking up neutrons, but when it decays, there's a flock of gamma rays go out, they're all over the damn place. So it's hard to pin down the vertex. So at any rate, it looks like this. So you get a, a pretty big prompt signal where you get the DEDX from the positron, and then maybe you know an exponential decay curve around seven microseconds later, you may get then the 400 keV EE of the capture with the sum of these two guys, and they they're going to add together because they just they literally go microns. So the the, the, uh, the I have a question, John. Can you take it now, or you want to? Yeah, wait? sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This is regarding the lithium loading. Is the yeah. lithium dissolved or kind of dissolved in the plastic scintillator, or is it uh, wow. in the form of a foil or something? No, 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 dissolved in the plastic, chemical trickery. Okay, so can, what is the kind of percentage that you can do without spoiling the scintillation? Uh, we tried some at 0.5% and it was bad. Okay. You can do maybe 0.1%. Okay. Uh, but there are wizards at both Livermore and Sandia that are understanding better and better how to play this game. So we had some made by... Uh, the company down in Texas a formulated for us, but it, it turned bad rapidly. It, okay. it began to, uh, uh, it began to uh, color up and uh, became relatively poor. So the, the, at the higher, higher doping levels, it, it isn't good yet, but it's good enough to, to do a good job for this at 0.1%. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, Here's an example. Again, these are hard to show in 3D. So here's an event that occurred inside the detector here somewhere, the dark blue cube. And then uh, the 
gammas come out and, and other low energy stuff comes out. And so you get some common scatters a long ways away and slightly delayed in time. And uh, then you get these projections onto these surfaces. And so what you can see is that you can make sense. If you look on one of these surfaces, it's hard to tell what the devil's going on. But if you look on all three, you can play games and figure out where the ionization took place. And you have not only amplitude, but you have time. And we would like to do time to the 400 picosecond level. Uh, right. So, uh, my golly, I'm finishing on time. The status of new lat as of this month is that it's uh, this prototype that I showed you the picture of with the graduate students is sitting in uh, Bruce's lab at Virginia Tech. We have made the electronics out here in Hawaii and we're working on software and simulations. Uh, and uh, for instance, my graduate student, I have two graduate students now working on it. They can't get to the lab. So we're, we're, we have to do software. Um, we were hoping to take it to a reactor this past summer, but that isn't going to happen, obviously. Didn't happen, won't happen, maybe not even happen this next year. Um, so we're studying upgrades. We have some nice ideas. And uh, Vivek, if you talk to Bruce, he'll tell you about some of his cool ideas. Bruce is the wizard of how to make these uh, these layers, we have some nice ideas. And for a bigger detector, we want to do a liquid fill. Plastic is expensive. Vivek, you said you guys yeah. maybe had some plastic, yeah. but yeah. plastic is uh, expensive. And for when we want to go to a few cubic meter version of this, we, we're going to have to do liquids. So then you need uh, something to make a, a, a windows around the thing. And we have some new ideas about how to do that. And Bruce has already made some uh, cute uh, windows that may work, but I, I have some better ideas, I think, but we'll see. Any rate, people have been encouraging us, could we make a version of this that would go to a kiloton? And uh, I think it doesn't work. I've tried several schemes, and I think for a kiloton, the better thing to do is to make vertical tubes with phototubes top and bottom and do it that way. But the full 3D structure, I don't think is practical for a full kiloton scale. So I think the new lat scale is probably up to a, you know, a couple of cubic meters. Uh, so anyway, yep, yeah, that's, that's it. And if you want to hear more, uh, you can, we could have a Bruce, Bruce especially would give, gives a good talk on it or one of the students or me. So questions. Yeah. Thank you, John, for an excellent uh, exposition. Uh, so let's take some questions. Maybe if, uh, can participants who want to ask questions raise their hands? Let me see if there is some, there are some already. Uh, so as of now, there don't seem to be any questions on Zoom. Uh, Satya, are there any questions on YouTube that you would like to uh, mention? Good, I've Satya. worn everybody out. Uh, yeah, there <laughs> yeah. are quite a number of them. And uh, actually, there are also a couple of questions from Zoom. Uh, okay. but oh, I see, I see some on the chat. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're, they're on the chat. Okay, not on the... Uh, nobody has raised their hands. Okay, so uh, let's take the last question, the first, uh, from Soumya. Is there any hint for sterile neutrinos from the reactor flux obtained using Watchman? I guess Watchman is still being built. So anyway, but yeah, I, I would John, love that. Yeah, I would love that. Uh, I I would hope that this sterile neutrino business would be better under control by the time we get Watchman on. But I have to say, I, I really don't know how this sterile neutrino business is going to work out. The fluxes are coming back closer to the predictions. They're they're still overall a couple of percent apart. And there is the five MeV bump, which is probably just mistakes in some of the beta decay uh, parameters. For you who are non, uh, nuclear physicists will probably get mad at me, but I always say to my Los, An 
Los Alamos friends and so on, the people who designed bombs. I said, what the hell have you guys been doing for the last 50 years? You've had all this money to design these, these bombs and you haven't measured carefully the, the nuclear physics that goes into it. What's going on? And their answer to me has been, we don't need that. We know how to build them. We <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it turns out that there are lots of mistakes in the, in the nuclear data tables uh, on, on beta decays. And as people have been digging in now, they're finding uh, even 10% mistakes in some of the more prominent beta decay channels. I have friends at uh, Oak Ridge that are working on this and here and there around the world. And so it's, it's tightening up, but um, I don't know, you probably watch this Vivek more closely yeah, yeah. than I uh, Maybe you if you allow me, I can, yeah, I can make a yeah. small comment on this. The, for yeah, instance, yeah. we did, could not even predict the decay heat that uh, came up in Fukushima when the reactor uh, you know, had to be shut down. So there are lots of Q values even that we don't know, lots of half-lives that we don't know, uh, leave alone the beta spectra. The beta spectra that was last measured was in the ILL. Uh, you know, one experiment, right. and th that was somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s. It's so we have, easy. I mean, this ex experimental information needs to be updated considerably, and that will, of yes. course, happen with the uh, radioactive ion beams facilities, but uh, also at reactors, I guess. And the ILL thing for those of you who are not in this business, the ILL. Oops, I just timed out. Our uh -huh. ILL measurements that everybody depends on were taken long ago and it's only one experiment and it's sort of yeah. all these experiments are resting on this one experiment yeah, yeah, which yeah, was done beautifully and very carefully and well but it's too much too hard to reproduce and nobody is working on doing it yeah. it's 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 really a shame yeah questions okay. then there is a question from jones i think it's a kind of pedagogical question uh, Jones, do you want to ask it yourself or shall I read it out? Uh, hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so my question is a bit basic question. Uh, what I want to ask is that uh, <laughs> we, know, we know we have neutrinos from the sun or anti-neutrinos from reactors. Uh, and you are talking about these wave packets and losing coherence. So how do we know how big the initial wave packet is? <laughs> yes, that is a damn good question. And, and it's the subject of many papers. So uh, that's the, when you first think about it, you say, well, how big should it be? Well, I guess, is it my uncertainty in measuring the energy or the momentum, the energy of some decay state or, or whatever? But I refer you to the literature for this. So it, it turns out that the claim by the experts is that we know it best actually from predicted best from supernovae. And so uh, I uh, suggest that you take a look at some of those papers, but it's a damn good question and it's a very hard answer to give. Uh, on the other hand, if we ever get to see it, it probably won't be so much from the uncertainty in the energy states, it'll be uh, the width of the pulse uh, which is surely longer than the decoherence length for large inter intergalactic distances. But that, that is a very, it, it's a, it drove me crazy when I first ran onto it. That's a, it's a great question and it is not easy to answer. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, let me see if there's some other question. Yeah, there are two uh, more. Questions. Yeah, there are two more from Ali to everyone. Uh, Ali, are you there? You could ask the question yourself. Hi, John. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, you said about uh, uh, enlarging the NULA to one kiloton scale. So uh, looking at what the performances you gave showed with this uh, six-way discrimination. So why yeah. couldn't we build multiple modules instead of- Well, we could, this? we could. It's just, it's just money. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Nothing stopping us except money, but you know, it's a, this is pretty intensive. You look at that little picture up there. So that's a five by five by five. So they're 25 per side. So six times 25, there's 150 phototubes needed for that little cube. 
And the number of phototubes, of course, goes up with the square of the dimensions and the volume goes up with the cube. So it gets better as you go to larger sizes. But uh, yeah, if we could make a standard one that is about a cubic meter, then we make uh, a thousand of those. So I think, you know, the problem is going to getting killed by, by large numbers. But the scaling is good if we could if we can make the, the cubes bigger and bigger and uh, we've thought about putting detectors that are say uh, silicon PMs uh, seeing the pattern of the light arrival down one of the channels and I actually wrote some programs to look at this and uh, I couldn't deduce how to work backwards from the, the light gets scrambled it tends to go down the corners and the columns but we you know, that maybe we can do something with that ultimately, but my first attempt at it didn't work very well. Okay, it's of a different configuration that uh, from the one you showed earlier. The one that uh, gets the light crumble at the edges. Oh, uh, well, no, yeah, it's just uh, was doing the calculations of the light propagating down by total internal reflection. It tends to there's, I, I'm a little unsure of the excuse. What I tell people is that I think there's more phase space toward the corners. If you think of it as being like a kaleidoscope, think of looking down a kaleidoscope and you see, well, you see virtual images near the corners and you see multiple images of the same thing in the corners. And so what that means is that light likes to, there, there's more phase space somehow out near those corners that the light comes down. But anyway, tracing it backwards is uh, is very tough. Oh, OK, OK. So the virtual volume gets reduced. Yeah. yeah. OK, you. there is a question by Kushbu Dixit. Uh, uh, is Kushbu Dixit there? You could ask the question yourself. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Hello. Please ask. Go ahead. So, hello, John. Uh, so Hi. my question, uh, yeah, my question was on uh, as a, uh, actually I have seen your paper on quantum com uh, on quantum communication using neutrinos, basically neutrino <laughs> communication. But so are you still uh, looking for some other uh, aspects of uh, that field? I mean, using these new LAT or uh, Watchman uh, yeah. detector. Uh, are you trying to explore something more in this direction? No, we've, we, we haven't pursued that very much. The best idea that I ever had in that regard was if an advanced civilization was tickling using giant reactor, a giant accelerator to tickle variable stars. And that could be done because variable stars are, are, are unstable at a certain point in the phase. So if you had a giant accelerator, you could tickle it and cause it to uh, ex start expanding earlier. And so you could fool with the phase of these variable stars. And so we thought, well, you know, that's a really crazy idea, but let's have a look. And we looked in some of the data, satellite data for, for the stars. And uh, indeed, uh, my friend Michael Hipke and I found a star pretty soon that was, was varying in a very strange way. We looked at the time between peaks and it was in two different distributions. And we go, oh my God, can this be signaling? And we were looking at it and trying to find a pattern. Eventually I talked to people who were in the business of uh, nonlinear dynamics and they looked at the sequence and they said, ah, this is uh, a strange non-chaotic uh, oscillator. So I'm getting aside, but it's great fun because there's a class of oscillators, which is neither chaotic, but is strange. It has a strange attractor. And these stars were the only known at first, there may be more now, only known example of a strange, natural, strange, non-chaotic oscillator. And uh, as it turns out, I think these are rotating, pulsating stars. <laughs> the amusing thing is the nonlinear dynamics community was stoked about this. They thought it was great fun. The astronomers didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the best thing that's come out of thinking about neutrino mm -hmm. communications. All the other things we thought about are, are impractical. 
well, not to say that that one's practical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank Are you. there any questions from YouTube, Satya, that you would like to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are quite a few of them. Let yeah. me. Uh, so why don't you start? Okay. Uh, this is Abhinav Chaudhary. Um, in what ways uh, would a more precise neutrino mass change our understanding of the universe? What would knowing the neutrino mass help in understanding the universe? Is that the question? Yes, that's right. Okay. So, uh, well, it, it, it can help a lot. So, first of all, what do we know now? We know that there are these three different mass eigenstates, and we know something about the separation of them, but we don't know the mass of the lightest state, which could be all the way down to being zero. Uh, it, it probably isn't. It, it seems sensible that it isn't, but who knows? We don't have in a unified theory of neutrino masses, let alone the quark masses. Uh, so we don't, we don't know. Now, uh, neutrino mass uh, can manifest itself in various ways in the, in the early universe. And uh, for instance, if there, people have been asking about, uh, about uh, uh, a fourth type of neutrino, and if there's a fourth type of neutrino, there have been some models that use the fourth type of neutrino to explain the dark matter and uh, things going on before the end of the Big Bang that would cause the expansion to be uh, just right and uh, could help explain a bunch of things like dark matter and so on. And that depends on these, on these neutrino masses and on whether there's a new so-called sterile neutrino or not. So uh, it also fits into uh, our discussions about uh, the early evolution of the, of the universe. But by and large, the neutrino mass doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. It is true that there must be out there a, about as much mass energy in neutrinos as there is in all the visible stars. So there's a lot of neutrinos. <laughs> they don't weigh very much, but there's a lot of neutrinos and there's a lot of mass energy in them. And uh, we've never been able to observe it. So could be some surprises lurking there. Yeah, so we get down and uh, why only the neutrino could be uh, measured on a fermion? Yeah, so, well, it's the only case uh, so the question is why why are why are the neutrinos uh, why are they why are they not Dirac particles and uh, why the answer is, neutrinos could be made on fermions. Well, many of my theoretical friends like Sandeep Sandeep always said, "Oh yes, neutrinos are definitely a Majorana." I said, "Come on, Sandeep, we've never seen a Majorana anything. All the particles I know and love are are are, are Dirac." So, uh, you know, it, it, it all depends, but it can only happen when they're a neutral particle like this uh, and, and so that they can be their own antiparticle. So the question of, of why that fits in, into theory is a, is a long question and I would defer, <laughs> I, I saw Jose, um, Jose would give a better answer to that question than I. But it's a long story. Okay. Uh, can, can, I, can I say something, Satya? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, from a theories, a theories like uh, neutrinos to be Majorana for the simple reason, if it is a Majorana particle, there is a very simple way of understanding why the neutrino masses are so tiny, the so called uh, CISA mechanism. That is the only reason. And there are other reasons connected with the baryon asymmetry in the universe and so on. Uh, but of course, theorists cannot decide it. They may like it, but only experimentalists can determine whether neutrino is Majorana. And that is, as far as I know, the only feasible experiment right now is neutrino less double beta decay, but they have not yet seen it. So the story, uh, story is up to that point. I mean, we have to wait to see whether neutrino is a Majorana particle. In my opinion, whether neutrino is a Majorana particle or a Dirac particle is the most important fundamental question about neutrino. 
Yeah. Now that oscillations have more or less been settled, the only unknown, real unknown is this question, whether neutrino is Maharana or Dirac. But unfortunately, yeah. neutrino less double beta decay has not seen it, so we do not know. And it's, it's very tough. And our experiments, the CAMLAN detector, for instance, is pressing down and getting close to the horizontal branch. Yeah. Yeah. Those of you who know the business, there's the there's a, a magic line that we get down low enough and uh, one branch goes down toward zero mass and the other branch will get eliminated and it could be that we will never know. It's extremely frustrating. Yeah, it is a very frustrating question actually. Okay. Uh, so thanks Rajaji. So we'll move further. Actually, there are quite a few questions. So. Uh, uh, what is the magnetic moment of uh, a neutrino and how it is measured? <laughs> this is again another well, question. How are they I missed something there. Uh, uh, John, the question is what is the magnetic moment of a neutrino and how well, it I, I wish I knew. I would be getting an invitation to Stockholm if I knew. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 uh, but people have put limits on it because uh, 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 it, it is. We know that it's it's very small, and uh, you know, used to be used as an excuse for why we maybe weren't seeing solar neutrinos because we could have magnetic flipping uh, uh, going on in the sun and so on. But they pref the accelerate. Sorry, reactor experiments have the best limits on this, and I forget where the best limits come from now. They were from. Taiwan, I don't know, maybe one of you guys remembers, but uh, so it is, uh, it is from Taiwan it, it, yeah. from a reactor experiment, I think. Yeah, and uh, so you know, if the neutrino has even a little tiny magnetic moment, then it could get its spin flipped, and that would lead to a lot of funny business. Uh, but we have no evidence for it. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll move Some on. Brand unified theories have, have such an input. Sorry, sir. Uh, yeah. The next question, again, something uh, in similar lines. Does neutrino and anti-neutrino annihilation happens? Well, it could happen, yes. Uh, it, it could indeed. Uh, so, uh, you know, the cross-section is going to be god-awful, and uh, I have no way to know how we could arrange it. Uh, people have talked about having photon, photon colliders along with making muon colliders. You can get enough, uh, you could get photons colliding, but I've never seen any proposal for neutrinos colliding. Uh, you know, there should be, if we pass two particles closely enough by, there would be some virtual off shell, off mass shell neutrinos, and we could get them to collide. But the, you know, the numbers have got to be just infinitesimally small. I don't, I've never seen any uh, idea of how one could do that. It, okay. uh, there's a question from Sadasiv Sahu. In vacuum oscillation, do the mixing angles really independent of the neutrino spectrum? Uh, are the mixing angles independent of the neutrino spectrum? I don't know how I got back to that, but the mixing angles have uh, nothing to do with the neutrino spectrum. The mixing angles are neutrino by neutrino. Each neutrino knows, in that sense, knows <laughs> what it's composed of. It, it's, mi it, it's mixing mass and what you measure depends on the spectrum for sure, uh, but the mixing angles have nothing to do with the spectrum of the neutrinos. I guess that's the answer. I, I'm not sure if I've understood the question correctly, but. Uh, there are also actually some uh, questions uh, still going around the neutrino oscillations. Uh, yeah, sure. Not sure. I mean, these are, uh, maybe you can spend a couple of minutes because there are Questions as like you know what are eigenstates, mass eigenstates, and so oh. maybe two oh, three Lord, yeah. can kind of give a very quick uh, uh, yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. 
sir. But let me read this question. So these are the type of questions I have. Quite a few of them. Why do neutrinos oscillate between different masses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that's what I was trying to do an oh. introduction for in, in the beginning. So let's let me go back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah. It will be nice. The, the neutrinos come out in a flavor state, and the flavor state is not the same as the mass state, and. <laughs> That is the most mysterious thing about neutrinos. What, as, as I said, what kind of a capricious God would arrange things so that you would think it, any sensible person would say, look, the flavor state, a muon makes a muon neutrino and the mass of the muon neutrino ought to be the mass of the muon neutrino, not some composite of three different neutrino masses. And you say, well, that's really cuckoo and it's not right. It can't be right. It's so crazy, but I'm sorry. That's in fact, exactly what is going on. So the neutrino is made of three different mass states, mass eigenstates, as we say. The mass is, is, a, is a, qua it's a quantum, coherent quantum state made up of three independent masses and, uh, yeah, it takes some getting used to. I, I, those of us who've been working in the business, when we first tell our students about this, they all go, "Now, come on, this can't be right. This is this is not right. This is crazy." Well, uh, you know, speak to the speak to the gods. <laughs> it wasn't our doing. <laughs> uh, Satya, uh, there is a question on Zoom. Sh shall yeah. I? Uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can yeah, okay. So Deepak Chakravarti has a question. He has raised his hand. So Deepak, maybe you should ask the question yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe this will sound a little crazy, but let me pose my question. Uh, you said that the neutrinos are, uh, the, we see neutrinos only in their beta decay or weak interaction, and they are not mass eigenstates. They are flavor states. Yes. The question is that the electrons which are produced in the beta decay, are they also in principle not in the mass eigenstate? Or in or other words, electrons which are say revolving around the atom, they are Very in the mass question. eigenstate. And the electrons which are produced in beta decay are not in the mass eigenstate. Yes. Very good question. But the answer is actually relatively easy because the masses of the, of the flavor states electron, muon, and tau are so enormously separated. Remember that the uh, mass of the electron is a half an MeV and the mass of the muon is, uh, is 106 MeV. So they're a factor of uh, 200 apart. And then the tau is orders, many orders of magnitude heavy. So, you know, the overlap in those mass states, which is falling off like uh, M over E, uh, M over E squared, I guess, and is you know the, the overlap is just non-existent. So in but, fact, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand that it's extremely improbable. But in principle, is this true that they are not produced in mass eigenstates? In principle, yeah. Uh, so people have been looking. Let's see. I guess we get into talking about. Uh, uh, mu to e gamma here, which is something that people have been looking uh -huh. for. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, John, there is this mu to e experiment, which is exploring, yeah, I, know. I think, that aspect. I, I was thinking that in some of these rare decay experiments, it should be showing up. Uh, I guess the mu e gamma, where they're down to, what is it, 12 orders of magnitude down? Something yeah, that's right, nasty. something like that, yes. And uh, so, you know, a lot of these things fall off as some power of the mass to the energy uh, squared or maybe even worse. And so these, uh, the possibility for that is gonna be suppressed by a, an, a horrendous factor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is true. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sure. Is there any um, other question from Zoom? Yeah, no, Zoom. Uh, Not yet, I think, okay. Zoom, I guess uh, there are uh, no, there are no more. Yeah. Uh, but let me. Oh, see. yeah, yeah. Someone was asking about neutrino communications there. By the way, I have a, a, an answer there that might amuse you. 
I have gotten phone calls from two people, uh, one Israeli and one guy in Norway, who wanted to get started in using neutrinos for fast trading on the stock exchange. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually offered me money to work on it. Uh, and I told them, no, thank you. But uh, the idea is that fast trading, if you can get even a millisecond ahead, you can make money on it. So, so we have an accelerator in Europe or in England, uh, you know, somewhere a long ways away. And, and the, the regular signals have to go by radio waves and through microwave towers and things. And so it slows them down to, to quite a bit. And so if you could have it set up to say, either trade or don't trade upon my signal at a certain point, then you could signal if you could get a neutrino beam so you could reliably get an event or two on time, you could uh, get some information to say from London to Chicago. And, and I think there might be some of these crazy people that are actually working on such. I have a little suspicion that something is going on. But, you know, I told them, look, guys, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to build something like this. Uh, and they said, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, I think you should think of a, you know, an accelerator, a small accelerator to give you about maybe 30, 40 MeV neutrinos, which are directional and yeah. do a coherent scattering. <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, the, the, it's a, uh, People have actually thought of trying to make money off of a neutrino beam, but not not anything I'm interested in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, Professor Arthur, I uh, there are no more questions okay. on the platform. Uh, so maybe we can. Okay, so we just uh, we thank uh, John for an excellent talk and uh, you know spending time on uh, answering all these questions. Uh, thank you very much, John. Well, it, it's uh, I think it's great fun. I, I just wish I were in, in Mumbai, but it's nice to be talking to people that are scattered around India. I think yeah. this is this is amazingly cool that we can do this. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, too. Yeah, it's fun. Great. Yeah. <laughs> take care. Bye. Yeah, take care, as they say, of, <laughs> especially of the COVID virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cocktail time. Bye, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay.